Okay, everyone, I want you to, if possible, take out a piece of paper, your bulletin will work, and a pen if you have one. You can even use your phone to write a note, I'll allow it. <laughs> People online, grab something you can write with. Don't worry, if you, if you don't have anything to write with, you just try to lock this in your mind. Don't worry, it's not a pop quiz. I want you to write down or to lock in your mind these three questions. One, who do you want to be like? Who do you want to be like? Two, what do you want out of life? What do you want out of life? Number three, how open are you to being changed? How open are you to being changed? And I'll keep that note handy because the sermon comes along with an exercise. <laughs> We're going to answer those questions, these three Lenten questions that I put before us this morning. These are three questions that I can't take full credit for. Theologian Frank Crouch says that these are the three questions posed by this text from Philippians. And these questions are designed to help us reflect. And that's what Lent is all about. Lent is a time of self-examination, an intentional time to examine our lives, examine our faith, to go inward so that we are prepared for Easter morning and all that that brings to our life. Now, self-examination can happen in a number of ways. Therapy is a good one. Another common Lenten practice specifically is fasting. Is anyone doing any sort of fast or giving up something for Lent this year? I know a few of us do that. This year, as last year, I am fasting from social media, Instagram and TikTok specifically. And this funny thing keeps happening. I keep finding myself with my phone in my hand my finger poised over the little Instagram icon. I'm so accustomed to just absently scrolling through my phone that this movement is literally in my muscle memory. That's not a great realization to have. So these days I keep catching myself mid tap and I go, oh, and I set my phone down and I self-examine, I'm working on building some of those new neural networks. I scan my body and I notice what I'm feeling. What am I trying to distract myself from? And I think about Jesus. Sometimes I say what I call a little hello prayer. I literally just say hi. Hi God, thanks for being with me. Sometimes I let my attention go to whatever is outside my window, and I practice mindfulness. And each of these are moments that I could have just scrolled away. My Lenten fast is giving me space to examine habits and to refocus myself on God and what is actually happening around me. Now, another Lenten practice is to feast to add on something. That's how I grew up 
celebrating Lent, a feast and a fast. So a feast, perhaps it's something like a new volunteer opportunity that you're taking on or an intention to spend more time with your friends. Perhaps you actually pick up that prayer book that's been sitting on your nightstand for months and months. Self-examination can also come in this way, through the addition of something new in our lives. Self-examination, however it comes, is central to the Lenten season. And it's the invitation of today's text, an invitation that I want us to accept this morning, to really engage with these three questions before us. So again, first question, take out your, your paper, your phone again. Who do you want to be like? And take a few moments and write down a few names that come to mind. Who do you want to be like? And we often ask children and teenagers a version of this question. Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Who is your role model? If you could have dinner with one person, alive or dead, who would it be and why? I actually think that was a question for one of my college apps. I can't remember who I put. We think this question is for those who are in the earlier stages of life, but this question applies to all of us. We all have people in our life whom we admire. Mentors, coaches, friends, parents, aunts, uncles. Maybe we even admire our own children or our younger colleagues. Age doesn't really matter here. Now, whoever you just wrote on your list, consider why you wrote them down. Why do you want to be like this person or these people? Is it for their dedication, their accolades, their creativity, perhaps their kindness or their intellect? Is it for their style, their wealth? It's important for all of us to identify who we want to be like and why, because these are people who we will in some way imitate. Today's scripture reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians says, brothers and sisters and siblings, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Now I have to be honest, I'm a little bit put off by that opening. I'm skeptical of any leader who tells his followers to be just like him. <laughs> it sounds a little egotistical. But, but if we take a step back, we recognize that Paul is actually offering some thoughtful advice. Imitate, he says, as in learn from, as in take counsel from, as in be a disciple of or follower of. Paul offers himself to the Philippians as a trustworthy leader. Trustworthy not only for his own merit, but for who he himself is imitating. Follow my example, Paul says, because I'm following an even greater example, the greatest example in Christ Jesus. And the Philippian community needed a trustworthy example. There's conflict in the Philippian community and confusion about who to listen to. There's all these different people who are trying to lead. And Paul gets really worried about them. So much so that he's moved to tears. He says, my friends, for many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you, even with tears, follow my example, says Paul, because I really care about you. I love you, and I'm worried that you might go in the wrong direction. Have you ever had someone say that to you? Have you ever gone in the wrong direction? Have you ever followed someone, imitated someone who did not have your best interests at heart? who do not have God's interests at heart? 
I mean, it happens. It happens to all of us. We follow someone who does not deserve to be followed. We cast our lot in with bad leadership. We're swayed by the lifestyles of the rich and famous who got rich and famous in ways that are antithetical to the gospel. We begin to imitate people whose principles are not God's. People who desire power at any cost. Who do you want to be like? Take a look at the name. Is there anyone you should maybe take off? And then, then consider the possibility that you are on someone else's list. Consider that there is someone maybe even in this room who wants to be like you. I bet there is. And then ask yourself, what does that person see? What do they see of my faith? It was common in antiquity to talk about imitation, for teachers to ask their students to imitate them as a form of learning. One could imitate Socrates or Plato. But Paul actually puts a spin on this common teaching form Paul asks the Philippians to imitate him and those who live according to the example. Paul is talking here about people in the community, neighbors, fellow church members, people in close proximity to one another. Paul tells the Philippians, learn from each other. Notice the gospel at work in and through one another. We all have faraway people we admire. I, mean, I admire Reverend William Barber and theologian Kate Bowler, but I don't know them. I mean, not yet. Maybe one day. We all have people who are far away who we admire, but it's also important that we have models with whom we are in proximity. It's important that we look to one another, literally the people in these pews, both physical and virtual, and imitate the good, capital G good, that we see. I want to imitate the love that Jay and Alice have for one another. I want to imitate Bethany's dedication to her music and to her students. I want to imitate Ingrid's passion for music and her fantastic jewelry style. <laughs> I could go down the line and name something I want to imitate about each and every one of you. I mean that. I was doing that as an exercise preparing for this sermon. I want to imitate Jean Krell's kindness and generosity. May he rest in peace. Who do you want to be like? Who in this congregation do you want to imitate? And what do you hope others see in you? Okay, question two. What do you want out of life? Take a moment and answer that as briefly as you can. That might be a long list. What do you want out of life? Again, this is a question we often ask children and teenagers and college graduates, but we all should have an answer. What do you want out of life? What do you want out of life? Paul writes about these other leaders, the ones who are not following the gospel. And he says their end is their destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a savior. Notice that he says we are citizens of heaven, not we will one day be citizens of heaven. As Christians, we are already co-workers with God. We are already called to be bringing God's community about here and now. Now, how does that factor into what you want out of life? 
Does it factor into what you want out of life? Now, we can want many things, but we need to be careful that those things don't conflict with or overtake our desire for beloved community. We have to be careful that they don't conflict with or overtake our citizenship in heaven. I can want safety. I can want that, but if the way that I'm going about that conflicts with the justice of the beloved community, I need to reprioritize. I can want professional success, but if that drowns out the voice of God, I need to reprioritize. Paul is concerned about these other teachers because they've distorted priorities. They are more concerned with earthly things than heavenly citizenship. Earthly things meaning anything else that promises to save your life, that promises success if you build your being around it. A politician, a diet, new technology, a military invasion. Earthly things promise to save us. They promise to make us younger, healthier, rich, healthier, richer, happier, and you know what? They might. They might. For a little while. But none of it can really save us. Can save us from our sins. Can save us from our wounds. None of it can save us from the fear of death. Only God can do that. What do you want out of life? What are you building your life around, and where does God fit in? Question three, how open are you to being changed? You could even put it on a scale of one to ten. One being not willing, ten being very willing. How open are you to being changed? I don't like change. I never have. My parents tell the story of when my family moved from Arizona to Alabama. And mom, I know you're on Zoom, so you can chime in later and let me know if I got this right. When we moved from Arizona to Alabama, I was just in kindergarten. And my parents didn't think it was going to be that big a deal for me. I was young. I hadn't known Arizona or honestly the world for very long should be easy. Oh, they were wrong. When they told me we were moving, I said, well, you can go ahead, but I'm staying right here with my friends. And then I promptly shut myself in my room. I do not like change. I have a small existential crisis whenever I cut my hair. Noah's here today, so he knows that that's true. I don't like it. I got a haircut recently. It's been hard. But change is inevitable. And as the saying goes, we never step in the same river twice. The cycle of life continues whether we want it to or not. And there are things that need to be changed. Structures, institutions, practices. There are ways we need to be changed. That we need to be transformed. Paul says Jesus will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Paul writes about the body not because bodies are bad. That's a common misconception. Paul writes about the body because our bodies matter. What we do with this life, this embodied life, it matters. And there are inevitably times when we do something wrong. Not just I dinged my neighbor's car wrong, but I made an idol out of social status wrong. I neglected the poor wrong. Or I was racist wrong. I'm talking about sin. We live in this world where perfection is held up as this goal, this impossible standard that so many of us are exhausted trying to reach. And so it's really hard to admit that we are not perfect, but it feels like such a relief to do it. To kneel before God and say, I did something wrong. I'm so sorry. 
forgive me. To say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me and know that God will do it. That we can and will be transformed again and again and again. I thank God for that. Thank God I can be transformed. I don't like change, but oh my gosh, am I glad that it is possible. That I don't have to carry around the guilt of every misstep I have ever made. How open are you to being changed? How open are you? Because God will do it. God is probably trying to do it. God will help you grow and flourish in ways you can only imagine, but you have to be open to it. Who do you want to be like? What do you want out of life? How open are you to being changed? Take a look again at your answers. What further self-reflection might they be inviting? How can they guide the remainder of your Lenten season? What action steps might you be called to take? I encourage you to revisit, to pray about them. Because God is in the work of transformation. Even in this wilderness, desert season of Lent. We just have to be open. Amen.